Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about how to value an oil and gas company. For this example, we're actually going to use Occidental Petroleum, which is the recent love child of Warren Buffett. So we're going to try to understand why he's pouring so much capital into this company. We're going to look at two different ways to actually value an oil and gas company using a traditional DCF and then also a proven reserves valuation method. If you're new around here, I wanted to quickly point out that you can follow along to any of my valuation videos. All you need to do is scroll down to the description and there will be a link for the model. You will need to make a copy of this model, but that will then grant you edit access so you can follow along and adjust my assumptions as needed. So we need a first level set. Trying to value an oil and gas company is an uphill battle if you don't have a lot of industry knowledge or technical knowledge. So I'm gonna to try to break this down as simple as possible from how I understand it. So when you open up the 10K for an oil and gas company, there's a few main things we're gonna to wanna to anchor in on and pull out. First, we need to find their proved reserves sales volumes and average price per barrel. These will be the basis of our model, whether, whether we go with the DCF model or a simplified oil reserve valuation model. So let's break these down one by one real quick. Proved reserves are the amount of known reserves that an oil and gas company has. This is oil, natural liquid, liquid gas, and natural gas that is still underground, but they have a 90% plus confidence that they can extract and sell. This number is important because if you see a company where their reserves have been decreasing dramatically year over year, then they may be having issues obtaining new land to drill on. And once those reserves run out, then they move into probable reserves. But these are more uncertain and could be very costly to actually extract. Once the reserves run out, it's sort of over. No more drilling unless you buy more land that has oil on it. The second important piece is sales volume. This highlights how much product they are moving annually. Both reserves and sales volumes will be reported by barrels in millions. And then lastly, we need to know the average realized price per barrel. If the company operates internationally as well as in the US, it gets tricky as WTI is the proxy for US prices, whereas Brent is the proxy for international. So you're gonna have to follow a lot of different spot prices. One of the hardest things about doing a valuation of oil and gas company is you need to make assumptions about future spot prices for oil, natural gas, natural gas liquid, as well as assumptions around the company's ability to replenish their reserves. And that can happen through the acquisition of new land or just exploration of current land. And also at a certain break point, it's not profitable to actually frack for oil. If the, spot, if the spot price drops below a certain place, then the extraction cost will actually outweigh the cost per barrel, making it economically infeasible. So these are all just a bunch of things that we have to keep in mind as we're looking at an oil and gas company. So now let's go ahead and jump into Oxy. I've pulled all of these items that I just mentioned above onto the oil analysis tab in my model. We can see they operate both in the US and internationally. In the US, we can see their proven reserves have stayed relatively flat at just under 3 billion barrels a year of oil equivalents. On their international side, we've actually seen a slight trend of a decline in their proven reserves from 1.1 billion to about 900 million barrel equivalents. A quick side note, you can convert natural gas to a barrel of oil equivalent. For Oxy, you do this by dividing the number they present by six. So for 2023, they had 4.2 billion cubic feet or BCF of natural gas. Dividing this by six gets us the US or gets us the equivalent barrels, which is 706 million barrels. Add that to the 802 million barrels of natural gas liquid and the 1.6 billion barrels of oil, and you get a total of 3.1 billion barrel equivalents in the United States. There's a lot of lingo within oil and gas, but overall the reserves are looking pretty healthy. Next thing to look at is the sales volume and how that compares to their, their proved reserves. They've been trending at around 10% over the last few years. This is a good sign showing they are not depleting reserves quickly, which is something some companies may do just to sell more oil and gas and pump up their revenue if they can extract it quick enough. The last thing to note is the average realized price per barrel. You can see this varies depending on what is being sold and whether it's in the United States or internationally. Now that we have this all mapped out, we can actually make some very high level guesses for how revenue will trend. I've broken this out into three estimates, a low, medium, and high. This is based on spot prices of the commodities being sold. The low estimate, I actually take the low spot price from the last five years that they've, that they've reported to estimate future revenue. For the sales volume, I've actually anchored all of all three estimates on to the 2023 sales volume. 
trying to estimate reserves seems like a futile effort that is worth that is more work than it's worth when they've trended pretty steady over the last couple of years. So what this assumption is really saying is they will continue to maintain similar levels of reserves and sell through about 10% annually that they replenish through new exploration activities. If we use the lowest spot price, we get revenue of 11 billion for their oil and gas operations. This is actually, and this will actually stay flat every year as we're not changing the projections to their oil reserves. So there will be no growth. It's just gonna be a flat revenue projection. Using the medium case, I take the medium spot price from the last five years, and we get revenues of 19 billion for their oil and gas. And lastly, when we use the high spot price, we get revenues of 28.7 billion. You can see how just based on spot prices alone, revenue can be 300% higher from the $11 billion worst case or low spot price case, making it very hard to value oil and gas companies. But now let's hop into the low spot price DCF and see how things are going. For this one, we keep the COGS at the highest percentage we have seen. This is because if revenues are lower from reduced spot prices, the cost to drill as a percentage of revenue will be more and reduce our margins. One thing to note is Oxy has two other business units as well, a chemicals business and a midstream and marketing business. I've held both of these at 5% annual growth as they are smaller business units and not the main driver of cash or revenue for Oxy. In this model, we have revenues dropping pretty sharply and then returning to a slow growth rate. This takes us from 28 billion in revenue in 2023 to 23.7 billion in revenue in 2033. Cash flows get cut in half and then they stay relatively flat around $3 billion. In this low spot price model, we get a valuation between 14 and 45 billion. If you believe spot prices are going to sharply decline, then Oxy is overvalued. Now let's hop into the medium spot price scenario. The only adjustments we're making is a lower COGS percentage and then increased oil and gas revenue. They go hand in hand. If spot price is higher then as a percentage of revenue, the drilling costs are less. So here we can see revenues drop slightly from 2023 to 2024 by about 4% and then slow, slowly growing, ending around 32 billion in a decade. Cash flows continue to grow each year as well. In the medium spot price model, we actually get a valuation between 52 and 118 billion. Oxy is probably undervalued in this scenario. They are currently trading around a $55 billion valuation, which is the low end of this model. And lastly, let's look at the hot. And lastly, let's look at the high spot price scenario. Once again, the only change here is we assume lower COGS and increased oil and gas revenue. In this model, we can see revenue grows from 28 billion in 2023 all the way to 41 billion in 2033. Cash flows also grow from 7 billion to 12 billion. In the high spot price model, we get a valuation between 91 and 191 billion, showing that Oxy would be severely undervalued if we believe spot prices are to be elevated going forward. The last thing I wanna hit on is a quick way to actually do a valuation, and that's to value the entirety of their oil reserves. In order to do this, we will lay out their total reserve balance Pick a variety of spot prices. I've used 15 different spot prices uh, for each commodity. With this, we will estimate the total revenue they could generate if they sold all of their reserves. In this case, the low end, we get 72 billion, and on the high end, we get 255 billion of revenue. This is a simple formula multiplying the spot price by the millions of barrels they have. After this, we actually need to layer in an assumption on operating margins as extracting the oil and gas is not free. We've used a range from 40 to 55%, as this is again a simple multiplication of total revenue by the margin percent. This is roughly what would be left over after extraction costs. Last is the net margin. This takes another 10 to 15% haircut as well, which gives us a sort of final valuation of their reserves. We'll actually anchor on the operating margin numbers for our final valuation as Oxy does have other business lines not captured in this oil reserve estimate model. So reducing further by 10 to 15% is kind of netted out with the additional profit driven by the other business units. If you're looking at a company that only does oil and gas extraction and exploration, 
you would actually use the net margin here. You could use net income or EBITDA percentage as a basis of the cash flow to get a better idea of that valuation. In our case though, with the 10 to 15% reduction from the operating to the growth or to the net, I don't think it's necessary as we are excluding their chemical and their midstream and marketing businesses, which the profitability from those kind of offsets the reduction from the operating down to the net income for just the oil and gas business unit. Anyways, if we're using the operating margin, we actually get a valuation of the reserves between 28 billion and 140 billion with 61 to 95 billion sort of being the sweet spot in the middle there, which I've highlighted in green. This lines up with actually our medium case model for the most part, largely because we are layering in very similar spot prices. I just wanna know, I have never formally valued oil and gas companies on the job. I had a quick training when I started investment banking where we covered this and my dad actually worked in oil and gas his whole career. So a lot of the technical jargon um, has been drilled into my brain since I was a child. But with that said, I do actually believe Oxy is undervalued. Oil prices did dip in COVID, but since the war in Russia with sanctions, we've actually steadily seen prices um, as high as 120 a barrel and as low as 70 a barrel. They currently sit around 78. So if these prices are to remain, I think this could actually be a great play. That's probably, and that's probably what Warren Buffett has been seeing as well. From just the reserves alone, if sold at current spot prices at $78 a, a barrel, you get roughly a $100 billion valuation after the extraction costs are taken out for those reserves. It does look like a solid play and makes sense why Warren has been entering since the stock price was around a $10 billion market cap just a couple of years ago. Anyways, that's all I had for today. Thanks so much for watching and leave any questions or comments below.